The Cosmic Cuchulain Theory posits that the Irish hero Cuchulain, the Irish god Lu, and King Arthur are all representations of Halley's Comet. But is it true? First proposed by Irish professor and dendrochronology expert Mike Bailey, the theory holds that a 6th century CE dip in global temperatures as revealed in tree ring chronologies from across Europe, Asia, and the Americas was caused by a close encounter with a comet, which in turn inspired stories of fierce, fiery heroes. More specifically, the tree rings point to two consecutive but potentially related dips in global temperatures, one in 536 CE and the second starting around 540 CE. Bailey, after failing to find ample historical evidence for what would have been a cataclysmic event for Earth's inhabitants turned reluctantly to mythology. And lo and behold, which well-known figure is said to have fallen in battle right around that time in either 537, 539, or 542? The legendary King Arthur. Indeed, the 10th century Welsh manuscript Annals Cambria includes an entry for the year 537 describing the quote, strife of Camlin, in which Arthur and Medrot fell, and there was great mortality in Britain and Ireland, end quote. From here, Bailey draws a direct line to the Irish hero Cuchulain, the Hound of Cullen, aka the Hound of Ulster, whom some believe was the original inspiration for King Arthur. Bailey points to descriptions of Cuchulain's physical appearance as evidence of his cosmic origin. The hero is said to have three distinct styles of hair that flow behind him in three long, shining coils. And during battle, when Cuchulain goes into berserker mode, one of his eyeballs bulges out of his head and blood squirts everywhere and the blood forms a mist in the air. From here, Bailey connects the dots to Lou, Cuchulain's biological father, although the latter is often and said to be a reincarnation of the former. Lu is one of Irish mythology's original heroes who famously leads the Tuatha Dé Nan, the Irish gods, in battle against the oppressive Fomorians. Given his shiny appearance, quote, the radiance of his face and forehead is so great that the Fomorians are unable to gaze upon him, some scholars have interpreted Lu as a sun god. But considering Lu rises in the west and travels east to save the day and not the other way around, Bailey proposes an alternative. Lu doesn't represent the sun, just like King Arthur and Cuchulain, he represents a comet. The fact that Lou's most common epithet is of the long arm or long throw is, in Bailey's estimation, further evidence of this point. And while Bailey doesn't specify which comet in particular these mythological characters are representations of, he does specify that his hypothetical comet did not impact the Earth directly. You probably wouldn't be here right now if that had happened. Instead, this Camelot conceiving comet would have passed by very close to the Earth sometime in the 530s, leaving behind a trail of atmosphere altering debris. Now, it just so happens that a very well known Comet did go whizzing by our pale blue dot around the year 530, Halley's Comet. No, the timing doesn't work out perfectly for a nuclear winter type event in the year 536 and another starting in 540, but I mean, come on, the dates are pretty close. So should we chalk it up to coincidence that Halley's Comet passed by just a few short years before? Research scientist and submarine impact crater expert Dallas Abbott, for one, doesn't think so. According to Abbott, those tree ring anomalies first observed by Bailey weren't caused by some cometary dusting in the upper atmosphere. Instead, she argues that a chunk of Halley's Comet broke off during its 530 CE flyby, eventually finding its way to Earth and crashing into the ocean in 536. Researcher Leroy Ellenberger, meanwhile, has proposed that rather than one major comet-related event, the climactic climate chaos of the 530s was caused by, quote, periodic heavy fireball storms punctuated by recurring Tunguska-class events, end quote. Whoa. Lending credence to this idea of a cometary bombardment is the fact that the core or nucleus of Halley's Comet is a rubble pile, a celestial body made of a bunch of smaller pieces that are loosely held together, and sometimes those pieces come apart. In fact, Earth has a long history of being bombarded with material that's been ejected from Halley's Comet. We pass through it every year during the Eta Aquarids, an annual meteor shower that peaks during early May. So case closed, right? Lou and Cuchulain and King Arthur were all inspired by Halley's Comet, a chunk of which, or perhaps several chunks of which, smashed into or exploded above the ocean, one in 536 and another around 540, causing a global drop in temperatures and widespread crop failures, thus making Europe more susceptible to the so-called Justinian's Plague of the 540s, which was the first recorded emergence of the bubonic plague or Black Death. The pieces all fit, the science, the history, and the mythology. As a natural skeptic, I like the fact that the theory's founder, Mike Bailey, was reluctant to make the connection between Irish mythology in the event of 536. This was a scientist who, in the years before ice core samples would shed new light on the subject, was at his wit's end trying to figure out what the heck his tree ring chronology data was trying to tell him. Turns out it kept leading him to the same place, Camelot.
a comet in King Arthur's court. What's interesting about the lore surrounding Arthur's death is that it's focused on this concept of a wasteland, a Celtic motif in which the barrenness and inhospitableness of a place is tied to a specific character. In this case, the Fisher King, aka the Maimed King, aka the Wounded King, who, like the land, was rendered infertile. So the question is, was this legendary wasteland inspired by an actual comet strike? Because Merlin does prophesy the birth of Arthur using a comet as his guide. Here's how Geoffrey of Monmouth, the 12th century Welsh cleric who helped make King Arthur a household name described the comet. Quote, there appeared a star of great magnitude and brilliance with a single beam shining from it. At the end of this beam was a ball of fire spread out in the shape of a dragon. End quote. It's also been argued that Arthur's father, Uther Pendragon, whose name can be translated to Terrible Head of Dragons, took his name from the same dragon-shaped comet. And according to journalist Edwin Emerson, that comet was none other than Halley's Comet, making its 530 CE flyby, although that timing doesn't really work out if Arthur is to fall in battle in 536. But still, considering we're dealing with myth and legend, we don't have to be sticklers about dates, because it's possible the appearance of Halley's Comet still helped inspire the original story, even if the narrative timeline was ultimately altered. Turns out that was par for the course in the 6th century. Something hairy this way comes. Since at least the 6th century, comets have been associated with plague, famine, and war. We know this thanks to bishop and scholar Isidore of Seville. Born sometime in the mid-6th century, Isidore wrote an illuminating hair-raising entry for the word comet in his etymologies. And I quote, A comet, cometa, is a star so named because it spreads out the hair, coma, of its light. When this type of star appears, it signifies plague, famine, or war. Comets are called crinite in Latin because they spread their flames like hair, crines. End quote. Echoing these ideas was the English monk slash scholar Bede, aka the Venerable Bede, born in the late 7th century. In his On the Nature of Things, Bede wrote the following, quote, Comets are stars with flames like hair. They are born suddenly, portending a change of royal power or plague or wars or winds and heat. End quote. Now seems like a good time to mention that King Arthur is sometimes described as having flaming red hair, fulfilling a folkloric prophecy that a redhead would lead the country in times of trouble. And now also seems like a great time to describe Cuhullin's hair in more detail because, who boy, it is wild. To quote Thomas Kinsella's translation of the Tanbo Cooley or the Cattle Raid of Cooley, you would think he had three distinct heads of hair, brown at the base, blood red in the middle, and a crown of golden yellow. This hair was settled strikingly into three coils on the cleft at the back of his head. Each long, loose flowing strand hung down in shining splendor over his shoulders, deep gold and beautiful and fine as a thread of gold. A hundred neat red gold curls shone darkly on his neck, and his head was covered with a hundred crimson threads matted with gems." End quote. I mean, is that a description of a guy with a comet tail for hair, or what? It gets weirder, too, because if you're not familiar with Cuhullin, during battle he enters this rage state known as the Riastrad, often translated as war spasm or battle frenzy. To quote the Tan, the hair of his head twisted like the tangle of a red thorn bush stuck in a gap. If a royal apple tree with all its kingly fruit were shaken above him, scarce an apple would reach the ground because each would be spiked on a bristle of his hair as it stood up on his scalp with rage." End quote. Imagine Cuhullin's head going full porcupine, and now imagine what that would look like on a cosmic scale. Sort of like an explosion, right? A firework. So is it possible that the description of Cuhullin entering his war spasm state is really a metaphor for a comet aka a hairy star breaking apart and exploding in the atmosphere? Uh, maybe? Again, the timing doesn't really work out story-wise because the Ulster Cycle, aka Red Branch Cycle of Irish mythology, the cycle that stars Cuhullin, is set primarily during the late part of the 1st century BCE. While Halley's Comet did pass by the Earth in 12 BCE, the myths of ancient Ireland wouldn't be written down until the arrival of Christianity in the 5th century CE, and it really wasn't until the start of the 6th century CE that monasteries started being built in Ireland, and thus it was that 530 passage of Halley's Comet that would have been perfectly suited to observation. It's an event that perhaps would have been top of mind for Irish scribes as they were putting down tales of Cuhullin and his father Lou. Because of course we can't forget about Lou, he's the third piece of this cosmic trifecta. A star is born. The god of many talents and namesake of the cross quarter day Lunasa, Lu was in many ways the original hero of Irish mythology, showing up on the scene during the mythological cycle to free the Tuatha de Danann from the oppressive Fomorians, who incidentally were led by Lu's grandfather, Baelor of the Evil Eye. When Lu first appears, he's as bright as a star, but traveling in the wrong direction for the sun. To quote from The Fate of the Children of Turin, It is a wonder to me, said he, that the sun to rise in the west today and in the east every other day. It would be better that it were so, said the Druids. What else is it, said 
said he. The radiance of the face of Lou of the long arms, said they. So, what has a face like the sun and some long arms? Could be a comet. What's more, Lou is sometimes described as having hair the color of fire. Physical features aside, what really sets Lou apart from the other Irish gods of the mythological cycle is his weaponry. Lou is famed for his use of projectiles and innovation at the time, that time being approximately 2000 BCE according to the Annals of the Four Masters. In addition to sending a special slingshot ball called the Tathlum, made from sea sand mixed with the blood of vipers, bears, and toads, right through his grandfather Baylor's giant fiery eye during the Second Battle of Moitura, Lou expertly tosses the Gay Assail, aka the Lightning Spear, taking out dozens, hundreds of Fomorians. The spear, sometimes described as one of the four treasures or jewels of the Tua de Danan, can fly around the battlefield on its own, never missing its marks, and like Mjolnir, it automatically, automagically, returns to the hand of its thrower. The spear is sometimes conflated with Eridvair, which, before being brought to Lou, courtesy of the Sons of Turin, had belonged to the king of Persia, Pisir. The spear needed to be stored in water, lest it burst into flame. Lou's son Cahulin, sometimes seen as a reincarnation of Lou himself, inherits his father's penchant for hurling enchanted spears. In Cahulin's case, the Gaybulg, aka the barbed spear, is thrown with the foot for some reason, and once it pierces its target, 30 barbs pop open, inflicting horrific damage. Again, we have that porcupine-esque imagery with the barbs exploding out, another veiled reference to a comet or a comet fragment bursting in the upper atmosphere, perhaps? And while we're on the subject of wicked and wondrous weapons, King Arthur's sword was once described as having two chimeras on the hilt, and quote, when the sword was unsheathed, what was seen from the mouths of the two chimeras was like two flames of fire, so dreadful that it was not easy for anyone to look. End quote. No, chimeras aren't technically dragons, but come on, they're basically dragons, so there could be a connection between this imagery and the aforementioned dragon-shaped comet. And the overall effect of Arthur's sword being too bright to look at definitely gives off Lou of the Shining Countenance vibes and could similarly be a reference to an approaching celestial body, namely, Halley's Comet. The Comet That Launched a Thousand Myths Indeed, the appearance of Halley's Comet in 530 in the subsequent global devastation, whether the two were directly related or not, may have inspired stories of dragons and fiery weapons and wastelands across Eurasia. In China, for example, it was noted that dragons fought in ponds and trees were broken by a passing dragon during the appearance of Halley's Comet in 530. Many at the time believed the dragon was connected to the decline of the dynasty. Speaking of decline, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with the Norse mythological concept of Ragnarok, during which the Midgar serpent Jormungandr is described as spraying venom through the air and thrashing around in the sea, creating huge swells. Oh right, and Thor kills the serpent, but not before the serpent fatally wounds him. Then there's the Beowulf saga, which features the night-goer Grendel, who lives in a misty marsh in of whom it is said, quote, every nail, claw scale, and spur, every spike and welt on the hand of that heathen brute was like barbed steel, end quote. Because weapons can't pierce Grendel's skin, all anyone can do is sit around and wait to get attacked. That is until a weaponless Beowulf rips his arm off. Then Beowulf discovers Grendel's home, which he shares with his mother at the bottom of a monster-infested lake, and yada yada yada. Decades later, a venomous, fire-breathing dragon emerges and starts torching the kingdom. Yes, in the end, Beowulf kills the dragon, but not before the dragon fatally wounds him. Interestingly, some scholars believe the Beowulf saga was inspired by the Tanbo Freyak, or Cattle Raid of Freyak, from the Ulster cycle of Irish mythology. In the myth, Queen Maeve of Connacht tricks Freyak into swimming in a monster-infested river. Unarmed, the hero is forced to battle a peisht, i.e. a serpent or dragon, with his bare hands, and in this case, Rutro, the peisht rips the hero's arm off. Ultimately, Freyak is given a sword and kills the peisht, but not before the peisht fatally wounds him. Fortunately, in one version of this myth, before Freyak can kick the bucket, 150 she, aka fairy maidens, appear and carry him through the cave of Krachen to the other world, where all of his wounds are miraculously healed. Which is not too dissimilar from how, according to legend, Morgan le Fay, aka Morgan the Fairy, brings brings King Arthur to the mystical island of Avalon to be healed after he falls in the Battle of Camblin. Whoa, there is definitely some storytelling symmetry going on here. But at the same time, these potentially shared cosmic origins highlight one of, if not the most confusing aspects of the cosmic Cuchulain theory. Is the comet the good guy or the bad guy? Because even the most amateur of yarn spinners would tell you that in a story where a strange fireball appears in the sky and explodes, plunging the world into a nuclear-esque winter that leads to millions of deaths, the comet would be the bad guy. So maybe we have things the wrong way round here. Maybe Haley's comet isn't Lou, it's Baylor of the evil eye. I mean, come on, the dude has a giant venomous eyeball that spews fire and can incinerate countrysides. His name means the flashing one. He's basically a comet with legs. And that means Lou represents the sun, which has always been his traditional interpretation anyway. And more specifically, perhaps Lou's hero archetype represents the sun re-emerging to restore and rejuvenate the wasteland. 
His arrival and or sacrifice marks the beginning of a new era, a changing of the guard. Viewed through this lens, King Arthur with his fiery hair and shining sword is the sun. Mordred, Arthur's traitorous nephew and architect of his downfall, is the comet. Thor, the sun. The world serpent, the comet. Beowulf, the sun. The dragon and Grendel, the comet and our comet fragment, maybe? And while I've always described Cuchulain as the Irish Incredible Hulk, maybe he's more like the Irish Superman, his power tied to the sun. Case in point, the story of Cuchulain's death. After Lugay Mech Conroy, aka Lugay, son of three hounds, who along with Queen Maeve had been an architect of Cuchulain's downfall, fatally wounds Cuchulain with a magical spear, he beheads our hero. Big mistake. A burning hero light surrounds Cuchulain's body, and in this blinding yellow glow, suddenly our hero's sword is falling. Whoops! There goes Lugate's hand, chopped off by the sword of a slain warrior. A new hero, Connell Kernick, then takes center stage, nobly avenging Cuchulain's death by pursuing Lugate and fighting him with one hand tucked into his belt so as to not have an unfair advantage. Long story short, Connell kills Lugate, chops off his head, brings it back to Red Branch headquarters, aka Emin Maka, sets it on a stone, and here's where things get really interesting because Lugate's decapitated head melts through the stone and falls right through it. Lugay is the comet, Cuchulain is the sun. Or at least that's one interpretation. What do you think? If you enjoyed this video, please like and comment, and basically just tap all of the shiny buttons, and by the end of it, make sure you are subscribed to the Irish Myths channel. That really, really helps. And if you want to learn more about the cosmic Cuchulain theory, check out my articles on the science and history behind the theory over at irishmyths.com. Might I also recommend my book, Irish Monsters in Your Pocket, a tiny little book about Irish dragons, werewolves, vampires, banshees, headless horsemen, and other beastly beings. My name is I.E. Neverday, editor of the short story collection Neon Druid, and creator of irishmyths.com. Thanks for coming out.